John chapter 5, verses 15 through 30. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them and said, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing, and the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to those whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave life he gave even so he gave to the son also to have life in himself and he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man do not marvel at this for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The main point of John's gospel is to cause a response of faith from those who would hear. In John chapter 20, you don't have to turn there, but in verse 30, It says, many other signs, therefore, Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The point of this book is to cause people to believe. And John reminds us at the very end, Jesus has done much more than all that I can have written, but these things I've chosen. So there's a specific reason why John decides to put these events in this particular order. Through the work of the Spirit of God and through the leading of the Spirit, he chooses these in order in a particular, uh, well, not chronology, but in his chronology, So that as you read, you will come to understand that Jesus Christ is God and that you must respond. What this means is that when you hear, there must be a choice made. You who are sitting here and listening, you must, every time you hear God's word, you must make a decision. You must respond to him. And for the unbeliever, it means that a person cannot be saved until he responds in faith. The sinner must choose to believe in Christ after hearing about Christ. In other words, salvation is activated when you believe. Turn with me for a moment to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, 
and hearing by the word of Christ. Okay. This text makes it absolutely clear that until a person believes, okay, he will not be saved. But when will this person believe? He believes when he has learned about Christ. Faith comes from hearing. And what that also means is that a person cannot believe until he's heard about Christ. He, he's learning about Christ. Someone teaches him about Jesus Christ. Faith begins from hearing the word of God. Faith does not occur or come by your imaginations about God. Faith does not come from hearing false things about God. And faith does not come when you make up your own notion about God and you start believing that. Those are called false faith. So faith without the knowledge of Christ is not true faith. Uh, one student of mine told me that in his church, the pastor simply told them, just believe. You just have to believe Christ and you're saved. And, and there's no content. It's just believe that Christ is there. Believe that Christ loves you. Believe in the historical fact that he actually died and resurrected. And boom, you're saved. And he gave indication that his mom who was dying in the hospital didn't believe until the last minute. He kept telling her, just believe, just believe. And she says, I believe. And then she passed away. And he says, I believe that my mom believed and she's in heaven. Now, we don't know what exactly went through her heart. But if she has no idea who, of who Christ is and she simply believes on some idea about God, I would say that is not true saving faith. Believing in fact does not save you either. Think about it. If it's fact, you will believe it. There's no indication that you, it takes a, an, a, an effort of faith on your part. Historical fact is fact. No one, it's, not, it does, it's not an issue of whether you believe it or not because a, history, a historical fact is simply that. It's just a fact. And yes, it, we can prove that it is a fact that Jesus Christ died and he resurrected. The empty tomb is an historical evidence that Jesus Christ did indeed rise from the dead. And the issue is not do you believe in the fact. The issue is do you believe in the person who resurrected. And for you to believe in a person, you need to know who that person is. You can't, you can't believe in some intangible being that you barely understand. So John writes what he does, going back to John chapter 5, as he mentions at the end, I'm writing, I'm compiling these things for you, so that as you read, you will learn about Christ, and you'll come to believe. In fact, what we're going to study today can be titled, basically, Who is Christ? And he's going to list all the theological implications about Christ, but not from his perspective. He's going to take the very word of Christ and his claims about himself, and he's going to present Jesus as who he is in what Jesus claims to be. But before we jump into that, let's just take an overview. Let's see the progression of how John lays out the first five chapters, as well as what's going to come afterwards. In chapter 1, John emphasizes this first aspect about Christ, that Jesus Christ is the one who created the world. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So he begins in chapter 1 as God, as Jesus Christ being God, the very creator of, uh, of the time in Genesis. And then chapter 2, he demonstrates that he is the creator by demonstrating he can take any creation and turn it into another creation. He changes water into wine. Now people might say, well, that's not a very significant miracle. I mean, you know, how is that so powerful? 
But if you sit back and think about it, he basically changed one aspect of creation and transformed it into another without any, without any effort. Just, he, it doesn't even say he spoke. He just said, just draw the water, take it to the master and, and give him a sip. And as, as they were doing that, it completely transformed. It was no longer water, it was actual juice from grapes. But it just appeared. John is demonstrating that Christ is the very God who can take an element and simply be, bring it into being when nothing is there. Our God brings something out of nothing. And in chapter 2, we're also introduced to the situation where he drives everyone out of the temple. And, and that itself is a miracle, even though theologians don't classify that as a, as a miracle. It's amazing because when God, when Jesus Christ as a human being steps into the temple, he simply calls everyone to leave, leave. Thousands of people are there bustling around, doing their business, sacrificing at the temple. At that one command, everyone simply leaves. They leave their money, they leave their belongings, and they just flee because God has now stepped in. No one rebukes him. No one questions him. No one arrests him. And everyone just stands back and they flee. And I'm sure they're wondering, why aren't we doing anything? And they realize that this man is powerful because Jesus is God. In chapter 3, we're introduced to Nicodemus. We see a long, drawn-out conversation between them two. And there John, through this conversation, the, re the recollection of this conversation, is demonstrating a theological conversation that he has with Nicodemus, who represents, basically, the teaching of Israel. He was called the teacher of Israel. And so here's God and Nicodemus, who represents Israel, talking, having a theological conversation and Jesus telling him, you missed the whole point of the Old Testament. And then in chapter 4, Jesus demonstrates that he knows all things. As he meets the Samaritan woman who's had five husbands, he calls her out, tells her exactly what she was like, knows the conversation, and then when the Samaritans are saved, he starts heading up north, and it says that the Galileans received him, but he knows their heart, and at the end of chapter 4, we have this interesting situation with this nobleman's son who was sick. He comes to Christ, Lord, please come and heal my, heal my son, and rather than going and, and being compassionate to him, the Lord Jesus Christ rebukes him and said, all you want is a miracle. You, you don't really believe in me. And there he's indicating he knows the intentions of every man's heart. He is omniscient. He knows all things. So by the time you get to chapter 4, you are wondering, how can I not believe? Jesus is God. He creates he can make anything. He speaks. He's powerful. This is the person the Old Testament spoke about, and he knows my heart. By the time you get to chapter 4, you should be believing. You should be believing. But in chapter 5, John introduces us to a situation. While up to chapter 4, he's given enough evidence, as it were, that Jesus is God. Undeniable proof that we must believe. But in chapter 5, he introduces us to a problem. Why people do not believe. And it is because of false religion. The healing of this man in chapter 5 by the pool of Bethesda, this paralytic man, he's been sick for 37 years. 
I'm sorry, 38 years. In verse 5, a man who was there who had been ill for 38 years. 38 years of his life, and we know it was because of his sin that he committed, uh, as we will see, as, as we saw later in verse, um, verse 14. G and the Lord Jesus call, calls him out and says, Don't sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you, reminding him you were paralyzed for 37, 38 years because you had sinned. But amazingly, and this is quite shockingly amazing, after 38 years, you just got healed. The obvious response, a normal human response, should be gratitude and devotion to the one who just healed you. Right? But the guy betrays Jesus Christ. He hands Jesus Christ over as a word to them. And he says, that guy was the one who healed me on the Sabbath. Why? Why did this man not follow Christ? And why did this man not believe in Christ? It was because he was trapped in a system of false religion that even after 38 years of being paralyzed and then being healed all, out of nowhere, his mind and his heart has been trapped in a system of false religion where even after he's healed, he cannot believe. Chapter 5 becomes a time when we as believers should be angry. Because a man like him, who is so incapable, Christ reveals so much mercy to him. And, and, and in one sense, it's not his fault. Because the religious leaders have taught this man in all Israel, if you don't obey the Sabbath, you're going to die and go to hell. They were literally placed in fear and bondage of a religious system. You know, when he's healed, they don't rejoice over the fact that he can walk. The first thing they do in verse 10, it says, So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is a Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. They rebuke him for being healed. Amazing. And he's afraid. They say, Who did this? He goes, I, I, I didn't do this on my own. Can you imagine? The, it's just an awkward, amazingly illogical situation he just gets healed he should be rejoicing and yet he's he's under fear of these religious leaders this is what false teaching does this is what happens when people begin to believe in things that are not biblical this is what happens. Now, you might think, well, this only occurs in the church. No, it's anyone who does not focus in on the truth, whether you're in a religious system or not, you are already believing in a certain thing in your mind, and that will prevent you from turning to Christ unless you let that go. After 37 years, you would think he would throw away this false religious system and realize, this is not helping me. But he's trapped. See, it's a shocker by the time you get to chapter 5. You understand what's going on? By the time you get to chapter 5, you should be saying, Christ is Lord, I believe. And then you come to this man and you wonder, why did he not believe? In the bigger sense, it's because of the religious system that he was part of. He could not let that go. On the personal sense, he could not let it go. And it's his responsibility. And then, as we will study today, the Lord begins to teach on who he, he is, and John presents that clearly. And then you get to chapter 6, and if you want to label the, the degree of miracles, this is one of the biggest miracles he's ever performed. He feeds 5,000 men. Now it records 5,000, but if you include women and children, the number could well pass 
10,000 people, he feeds them with five loaves and two fish. And afterwards, he has 12 basketfuls of food left over for the disciples to let them eat personally after serving. You see what's going on? It's like a culmination. And he's building it up from chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. Christ is God. He knows all things. And in chapter 5, there's a brief moment of, of, of difficulty where this man cannot believe even though he's healed. And in chapter 6, John just pours out this miracle and says, can you not see? And in fact, after he does perform the miracle, people tried to force him to become king, but it was with the wrong heart. And after he feeds them, he begins to teach them that he's the bread of life and that they need to eat him and drink his blood. And people are just like, oh, we don't like this teaching. And from this moment on, you see a greater degree of rejection. People don't want to follow him. He's done so much. Undeniable proof that he is God the Father, God the, Fa God the Son, the Father's Son, and he is equal with God. He's just performed this amazing miracle, and when he tells them, you must eat me, you must drink my blood, and he's being obviously metaphorical here. He's not saying literally, but they could not handle this teaching, and then he turns to his 12 disciples, are you going to depart from me too? Because everybody's leaving now. And then in chapter 7, this is so sad. It says in chapter 7, verse 5, for not even his brothers, meaning his own family members, were believing in him. Jesus was the first son, the first child, and then Mary and Joseph had other children, but they did not believe in him. They saw his miracles. They, they, they knew this brother of theirs was special, Never sinned, never did anything wrong, perfect. And their hearts were closed. And then you have chapters 14 through 16 where three whole chapters are just devoted to Jesus Christ in the upper room with his 12 disciples teaching them in a private setting. And then afterwards you know what happens. He's crucified. So as you see, as you read through the Gospel of John, you're confronted with three things. Number one, Jesus is who he claims to be, that he is God. But number two, people choose to reject him. But number three, now this is really what John is saying. Only those who are chosen will believe in Christ. Only those who are chosen will believe in Christ. And so now you ask again, to whom is John writing this book? He's writing to all who are the elect and yet not have yet come to faith. He's writing this so that those who are chosen of God before the foundation of the world will hear and believe. And this is exactly what we've been studying in Titus uh, on Fridays. Paul, chosen of God, sent to the chosen of God. The church is a ministry of the predestined. Okay? The church is a ministry to the predestined people, the elect. Now, we don't know who the elect are. Okay? And so we give the gospel to the world, to anyone that we meet, but if they are the elect and if it is God's timing, the right time, then they will respond and they will eventually join this body and begin to worship God together and they will reveal the fact that they have been chosen. And as I said before in the beginning, just because they are chosen does not mean they will automatically believe on their own. The way God designed this was so that we would go and activate their faith by the giving of the word of God. Them being chosen does not mean they have no volition of their own. They have 
will and they have volition. How this all works, I don't understand. But it does not mean God just brings them in and, and just forces them to believe. He grants them the faith, but they too must believe. Again, it sounds, I know, I understand. It sounds contradictory, but that's what the scripture says. He chose before time began. The only way the elect will come to Christ is if we go and give the gospel to them. Now, it starts making sense, however, when you stop thinking in terms of making this church bigger by number. Let me explain what I mean by that. Okay? People have a difficult time with this idea of predestination and evangelism because they're thinking strictly in terms of church number growth and how to get people to come to church. Now, it might, you know, it might be with the right attitude, meaning they want to see the church grow, to see more and more people come to Christ, but they're strictly looking at it from man's perspective of trying to convince someone to turn to Jesus Christ, joining the church, and allowing the church to grow in numbers. We need to get that out of our system. The way this works, and we'll discuss this more in the upcoming weeks, okay, and we'll make it very clear, is that there's a bigger plan than us trying to draw people in. Before time began, the Father chose a certain amount of people on earth to give to His Son as a gift. This is something that the Trinity has planned. This is what God has designed. The salvation of our souls is not for our sake. It is for the gift to Jesus Christ. We'll get all into that later on. I just wanted to give you a summary indicating that we have to look at predestination, election, and the spreading of the gospel not in terms of man to man, but from God to Christ. It's another dimension, a dimension that is beyond our comprehension. Because if you think just in the humanly way, it doesn't make sense for us to go and evangelize. Think about that. There's no way to resolve this tension with our human logic. Why do I go and give the gospel when I don't know who the elect are? It's just like shooting a bullet, you know, blindfolded, hoping that you will eventually hit the target. Because if you look at it strictly in terms of that activity, that's all it is. That activity of maybe hitting the point at one point in your life. It's just one out of many chances. It really doesn't make sense. Humanly speaking, that is. And I've struggled with this before. As I'm evangelizing, you know, I know I have to keep going until I hit one of the elect, but even when I do, the person doesn't come to Christ. And this is why so many people come up with like how to be more effective with, with evangelism. Use this technique, use that technique, speak like this, bring this up first, and they'll constantly think of humanistic ways of trying to convince someone to follow Christ. But you see, evangelism is not a human work. It's the work of the Father drawing people to himself so that he can redeem the elect and hand it over to his own what? Son. It's a gift to his son. And then amazingly in the book of Revelation, the son turns it all back and gives it back to his what? Father. It's like between them. It's between God and his son. What happens at the end of the book of Revelation? You have the marriage of the Lamb and the church, right? You know, just, it says, husbands love your wives, as in Ephesians 5, you know, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for what? Her? That you got to kind of expand your mind to all that's going on and realize that this is something between the Father 
and the Son, Jesus Christ, and we're caught up in this plan. We, we have to stop looking at it in the human perspective, but in terms of the work of God. And John is writing his epistle for that purpose, to honor Christ by writing what he did and using what he wrote to draw the elect so that Christ might be praised and glorified. Only those who are the elect will come to Christ, and this is why we teach the scripture, because only the scripture can cause true faith to be activated in the heart of the elect. And in that sense, they believe because they were chosen to believe, and they were given the grace to believe as a gift. But on the human side, they have to hear the word, and they must believe. And if you are listening to this, you must believe. The question is not, well, am I elect or not? Well, you don't know until you start believing. Believe and you will realize maybe that you have been chosen of God. So the question is not, what method is most effective? There's only one. And it is speaking and proclaiming about who Jesus Christ is as John does in John chapter 1 through chapter, uh, chapter 21. This is why so many people, when you ask them, what book should I start with? They would always say either Matthew or John. Usually John because John presents Christ uh, with irrefutable indication that Jesus is God. Because that's his point. I want you to believe. I want all those who are the elect to believe. And this is why Paul says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. His whole life was revolved around being caught up in this plan of God redeeming the people to give to his son as a gift. And when Paul re- realized that, he realized that this is the purpose for his life now. For the rest of his life, whether he's going to suffer or not, whether he's going to go hungry or not, whether he's going to be persecuted or not, his whole life was focused on one thing. I want the Lord to receive all that God has chosen for him. Guys, this is our purpose in life too. If you ask, like, what does God want me to do? What does the Father in heaven want me to do? He wants you to redeem the elect so that Christ might receive that which God would give to him. When you evangelize, you're doing it for Jesus Christ and that you want to bring everyone who's been chosen so that Christ might receive the gift from the Father. And just as Jesus pursued the Samaritan woman, we too must pursue those who are lost. So we devote our energy to evangelism. We devote our energy to prayer. We devote our energy to living righteously and above reproach. Why? For the sake of those who are chosen but have yet not come to Christ yet. It should drive us. Everything that we do, job, study, school, family, life, friends, whatever we have, it's all about that. I'm looking for the elect. I'm going to give the gospel to all that I meet, hoping that they are the one who have been chosen to be be given to Jesus Christ. And guess what? Someone came to us, gave us the gospel. We were now given to Christ. Now the Lord Jesus wants us to redeem others as well. It's about Christ, not about this physical gathering of people. Do you understand? It's not about numbers. It's not about what we look like before people. It's not about when people come here or they'll see that this is a big church or a small church or a loving church. It's not about that at all. It's about Christ and the gift that the Father has redeemed for Him. That the Son might be honored. That the Son might receive His gift. Now you realize that when you evangelize and when you go, it is because you love Jesus so much. You were chosen to be given to Him, 
and you want to find others who've been chosen that, so that they too might convert, that they would also grow. And then you realize why church is so important in terms of edification. Once you say, once you, once they are saved through the preaching of the gospel, now they have to be cultivated, matured, and brought to fruition. They must start looking like Christ. The Father wants every children of God to look like His, His first son. This is why John writes his gospel. Not just to escape the wrath of God, not just to be a Christian. There's a bigger picture to be forgiven and then to come into the, the presence of the Father and the Son, the Trinity who loves you, and to be a, a, a love gift from the Father to His Son and to be wedded to Him we, the bride of Christ, him as our husband. And only those who are chosen will accept what I just said. Only those who have been chosen will understand what I just said and receive this and accept it, and you will believe. You will believe and receive this teaching. If you have not been chosen of God, you will not believe what I just said and believe in Christ. If you have not been chosen, you find this to be weird, to be strange, to be illogical in your mind, to be insensible. If you are not chosen to you, this is just weird. This is, it doesn't make sense, but, but you come because you want to be religious, then you are like the paralytic man stuck in a system of religion that you fabricated in your mind and you're living in an entrapped manner of life. So in John chapter 5, as we go to verse 16 now, beginning in verse 16 down to verse um, 30, Jesus Christ speaks of himself and he describes who he is. John is now taking all the statements that Jesus has said and puts it together so that people can read what Jesus claims of himself. And in verses 16 to 18, number one, Jesus claims that he is equal to God the Father. Jesus claims that he is equal. He's not second ranking. He's not any less than the Father. He is God as God is the Father. And it is shown in three ways. Number one, in verse 16, Jesus created the Sabbath day. Number two, Jesus does the same work as the Father. And number three, the response of the Jews from what Jesus has just said, clearly indicates that they knew what he was talking about, that Jesus was claiming to be equal to the Father. Let's look at the first one in verse 16. It says, For this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. The first thing Jesus indicates as why he's equal to the Father was by doing these miracles on a particular day where he knew that the Jewish people would be upset. The Sabbath. The Sabbath. Now, the phrase the Jews here is not referring to every single Jewish person. It's referring to the religious leaders who represented all of Israel. It basically represents all... They, they themselves represent the Jewish nation. And, and John makes it clear here that, that the reason why the Jews were so infuriated and they were persecuting Jesus, not so much because he was healing the sick and helping the poor, but it was because he was doing that on that particular day, the Sabbath day. And the phrase, he was doing these things, 
In the Greek, it's what you call the imperfect tense. It's a continual. He, he kept on doing it. Like he made it a goal to wait until the Sabbath. And when the Sabbath day started, he started to heal people. He was making it a point. He, he wanted to make it a goal to, to make it clear that on the Sabbath, I'm going to start healing people. Now, John doesn't mention all the people that were healed, but if you look at other passages, like in John chapter 9, he healed a blind man. Mark chapter 2, verse 22 to 28, he tells his disciples to start picking grain and eat it. He heals a man who's, whose hand was shriveled in Mark 3, 1 through 5. He cured a woman who had been crippled for 18 years in Luke chapter 13. A man who had dropsy, he healed him in Luke chapter 14. And all of these healings took place, and the Lord kept purposely doing this. So in one sense, the Lord was asking for persecution. Why was Jesus so purposely trying to do all of these things on the Sabbath and not on any other day? It was because he wanted to demonstrate, number one, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the king. He's the one who created Sabbath for the people. Sabbath was not created for God. Sabbath was created for man. And since he is God, he can do what he wants on the Sabbath day. But the main reason why Jesus did this was because Sabbath regulation revolves, revol I'm sorry, the, sa Sabbath reg the whole Jewish system basically revolved around the practice of Sabbath regulations. If there was anything in the life of the Jew that indicated that he was a Jew, number one was a circumcision, but if you're a woman, uh, you couldn't be circumcised. So as a man or woman, what, what made your life Jewish was this observance of the Sabbath. And the false teachers basically convinced everyone if you do any kind of physical effort, and they made a whole list of these, you're going to break the Sabbath, and you're going to receive condemnation from God. They, they scared them so that on this day, no one tried anything. And, 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 and it's clear from John 5, 1 through 15, this crippled man who's just been healed after 38 years of being paralyzed was still trapped in that system. He could not break out of it. He was free from his illness, but in his heart, he was still under the authority of the Pharisees that, who told him, you shall not break the Sabbath. You know, don't pick up your mat and walk. And that's what false religion does, as, as we mentioned earlier. And because the Sabbath was the hallmark of their religious system and their abuse against the people of God, Jesus is using this very day to perform his miracles as a direct attack against the false religious system of that day. Think about it. Jesus could have healed on Friday, on Wednesday, you know, Wednesday, the, Wednesday or Tuesday, or somewhere in the middle, far away from the Sabbath, and this man's life was not in danger. He's been there 38 years. What's one more day, right? But the Lord wanted to expose them and call them to repentance. And just as a side note, this is, a, okay, aside from the ministry of the church of, of evangelizing to people who've never heard the gospel, one of the ministry of the church is to expose false teaching of other churches. This is not to attack churches. It, it is to expose false teachings that other churches might have embraced. So the church has a twofold mission. Yes, one, to go into all the nations and, and, and make disciples of all nations and give the gospel to those who've never heard the gospel. But as, as what Jesus did here, he exposes those who are teaching false things in the system of religion that they were all part of. At that time, there was obviously no Christian church. Everything was a Jewish synagogue religion. 
They messed up all the teachings of God. So in the same principal way, as a church who believes in the truth, we have to nonetheless expose other ministries that are teaching false things. You, well, you say, how? Well, not naming them, but just teaching the truth on our own and at times comparing what we teach and what they teach. We are never to say, oh, they can believe this and we'll just believe that. Let's all just join hands and let's just sing Kumbaya. Okay? One way that we uphold truth is by joining the membership of this church, signing a document that says, I will uphold the truth that this church teaches from the scripture, and you not tolerate other teachings. And Jesus made it a point, because false teaching prevents a person from truly believing. Now, what is the meaning of the Sabbath? Turn with me to Exodus 31. And we're going to have to close with this. You know, what is the meaning of the Sabbath? Now, aside from Genesis 1, where after seven days the Lord, I'm sorry, after six days on the seventh day the Lord rested, you know, is he really in heaven just lounging on his, um, on his beach chair, you know, and all the angels are around him just praising him and he's just sitting there just enjoying life? Well, I don't think so because Jesus just said, my father is working and I'm still what? Working. And in Colossians chapter 1, it says that Jesus upholds the world by the word of his power, meaning he's constantly exerting his energy, as it were, to keep the solar system in place, causing everything to turn precisely, watching every animal, feeding every bird. Remember when Jesus said, don't worry about life because the Father in heaven, he knows when this bird will die. He knows how many hair you have. Don't worry because I'm taking care of everything. That's what he's saying. Every creature, every insect, to every animal in the sea, to the birds of the sky, to even the number of hair we have. And yes, God decides if you're going to be bald or not. He's going to sustain you as a bald man one day, and I'm afraid of this one day. But he's working. You guys understand? He is working every moment. The scripture says he never sleeps. So what is the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath was given to man to rest. Chapter 31, look at verse 12, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, But as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbath. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. And he, what he's saying is, this is an indication that you are my people. That you're going to do what I did after I created the world in six days, I rested, so you rest. It will be an indication that you are like me. Therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from his peoples. The consequence is very severe, right? You break the Sabbath, you're going to be cut off. But you have to understand, it, 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 the Pharisees looked at that consequence and made such a big deal out of it that they asked, well, what does God mean? And they came up with these rules that you have to follow. And one of those rules were, you shall not pick up your mattress. They had rules where you couldn't gargle more than like a few times and then spit it out. They would gargle vinegar to disinfect their mouth. You know, it's like, it's like a mouthwash. And you couldn't even do it at a certain time. And then you couldn't walk a certain amount of steps during the day because that would be breaking the Sabbath. And if your neighbor's ox fell into the pit, you couldn't, bring, you couldn't pull it out and help them because that would be considered a work. You leave the animal in that pit for a whole day and that animal might even die. But it's observing the Sabbath. 
Well, here, the Lord doesn't make it clear what that is except to say, cease from your work. And most likely, it's referring to the work that you will do for six days. Most likely at that time, farming. If you're a slave, doing slave duties. Whatever daily duties you do to live, after six days, you would cease and you would rest. MacArthur says, the Old Testament prohibited working on the Sabbath, but did not specify exactly what kind of work was forbidden. It seems, however, that one's customary employment was in view. The Israelites were not to participate in their normal week-long occupations on the Sabbath day. But rabbinic tradition went far beyond that, listing 39 forbidden categories of work, including carrying goods. When God created Adam and Eve in their perfect state, he created them with limited energy. They had to eat to replenish, and after six days, it was physically good for them to rest. But there's more to it than just physical resting. It meant to be, spend that time speaking with the Lord. In Genesis, you have Adam and Eve in the garden. All day they're working, tending to the garden. At night, they will spend together and then there were times when the Lord Jesus Christ would visit them and he would walk with them. Maybe that was during the Sabbath. But you see what, what was, what's going on. You would work hard at your occupation and then you would rest with the Lord, spending time. So it indicates worship. It indicates honor to him, communion with him, physical recuperation, and the joining together of of the saints in worshiping God. Now, I'm going to go into this more specifically next week uh, as to do we also um, uh, follow the rules of the Sabbath and the answer is no. But I think the principle of the Sabbath is very clear. It is given to us by God. And also just as a clarification, Sunday is not a literal Sabbath. Okay, literal Sabbath is a Saturday. But by principle, the Christians met on Sunday, and this day becomes our time of rest and ministry. Not just the ceasing of all activity, but escape, move, turning aside from our daily duties so that we can minister to God and minister to one another. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. The false religious system at that day turned it all around, turned it upside down, and forced people to disobey God while they thought they were obeying Him. What a tragedy. Let's, let us keep these words in mind and realize the truth will set us free so that we can believe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We truly appreciate all that you have done. Thank you for giving us um, this command to rest. Help us to understand uh, your word carefully and know that you are the Lord of the Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.